we'll keep this nice and simple. Go to patreon.com slash Productions to support our show. For less than the cost of replacing your hand with a shitty wooden replica, you can support our show and keep, and keep it rolling. That's bonus episodes, early access, exclusive content, and so much more. Don't take too long to make the right decision. Go to patreon.com slash Productions today and enjoy the show. When the moon hits you, I like a big pizza by that some more. When the world seems so shy, like you had too much. Love well, can make you do some weird things, like uh, make a podcast for years and years, hoping someone will eventually listen to it and tell you it's good. Welcome to the After Credits Cast, the only film podcast that is confident you'll love us or your money back. I'm your host, AJ Wiseska, and I'm joined by Ryan Metters. Are, 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 are we offering a, a, a refund on the podcast, my guy? To be fair, you get it for free in most places, so I mean, you, you're not really getting anything back either. You know what? That's a loophole and I'm fine with it. Hey, y'all, <laughs> and welcome to the show. Uh, indeed, and if you are listening to us, you might be listening to us on one of the platforms of choice, including Patreon, YouTube, Acast, Google, or Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, TuneIn, Podbean, Podcast Addict, uh, Spotify, maybe, if I got that working right. And uh, so much more. Google us, you will find us. I don't have an intro song planned for this week, but again, editor, if you were so kind as to put it in here, that is a good song. I agree. You, you made an excellent pick. Uh, <laughs> Ryan, are you excited for today's movie? You know what? I am. This was a uh, this was an interesting one. It's <laughs> this is a very interesting one. It's not in our usual wheelhouse. For sure, um, we do a lot of action. We do some. We do quite a bit of horror, much to your chagrin. Uh, we we do uh, animated stuff. We do Godzilla, whatever you want to classify that as. Honestly, uh, we go all over the place, but we really don't do a lot of. Is this a rom com, or would you call this more of a straight romance story? Uh... So I feel like it, I feel like it doesn't really dive into comedy, but it also isn't without comedy. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, I feel I feel like it's uh I, I'd go so far as to call it a rom com. I would. I would. Okay, okay. So this it's more it's f- more like it's more like unintentional comedy rather yeah. than like people actively making jokes. Like it's more just look at how how very interesting this uh this culture is and how crazy these people are, but they're not trying to be funny, they just are. Oh yeah, we're we're not going like full on always sunny in Philadelphia crazy, but like just real life crazy. Yeah, yeah. Um, but now this is, I would say this is probably our in- inaugural uh, rom com of the the channel. So uh, depending on how we do here, we might do more. I will not promise anything because yeah, I don't know. Uh, welcome. A rom com month. Oh boy. God, you, you do what the funny thing <laughs> is. If we do that, I guarantee you, Chaz will be here for it. I have so I have some movies we could do if we wanted to go into rom com. <laughs> he, he's got some bad ones, and he openly admits they are bad, but he loves them. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so welcome to another installment of Rage in the Cage. Tonight we will be uh, talking about 1987's Moonstruck, written by John Patrick Shanley and directed by Norman Jewison. Uh, the film was a, uh, made approximately eighty million dollars worldwide, which is about five times what it cost. Not bad, not bad. Considering the kind of movie it is, that budget seems fairly reasonable. Um, the cast includes a few names I may pronounce here. Uh, Nada Despotovich, uh, Paula Truman, Leonardo Cimino, Camino, uh, Fyodor Chel... This one I'm not sure. Uh, Chaliapin Jr.? Yeah. I think so. Uh, Louis Gus, John Mahoney, who I remember from Frasier. Fun guy. Frasier! Yep. Yes, sir. Marty Crane. Mm-hmm. Uh, Julie Bavoso. Uh, Danny Aiel- Aiello. 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 Uh, Olympia Dukakis. I know that one. Uh, Vincent Gardina. Cher. There's no last name. I'm sure you're all aware of this. Uh, and Nicolas Cage. Yeah. Was I the... Uh, so, I, I... Like... I was... I, I must be the only person who, who didn't know this, but... Cher is drop dead gorgeous. What the fuck? So I, I, I just haven't been checking for Cher this whole time. Cher is one of those people I think from the older generation who I think we kind of missed the radar on. But when you go back and see some stuff, yeah, she's attractive. I will not argue that one. 
Yeah, I'm sorry. I was just I was getting I was getting uh uh I was getting distracted throughout the movie because I was just like I'm having a hard time listening to people speak. I'm just staring at you. This was even before she got all gussied up. She's just she's like she she has that that very like very believable beauty. Like it's it's a very natural just wake up out of bed gorgeous and i'm like uh all right <laughs> shit hello what? hello so, oh, so, hi so i did just check so she was born in 1946 so that would make her a baby boomer right uh, oh, <laughs> i think so. <laughs> so 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 yes ryan it makes a lot of sense that we missed the bus of that one because she was definitely of two generations ago that that would be outside Fair. of our lives. so i no, Fair. no no shot against her though she's still she's still rocking it in this movie but uh yeah Makes sense why we millennials would have missed that boat. Um, the movie did win 18 awards. None of them for Nicolas Cage, unfortunately. But... <laughs> <laughs> we'll get there! We'll get there! Uh, I, I, I like... Nick. I like doing movies where it wins a lot of awards for Nick, and Nick Cage is down a single one of the winners. <laughs> I love that man, but Jesus Christ. Uh, these are... I, I I feel bad for those, but for this one, no, I get it. I <laughs> Every, a, a lot of people brought their A game. It's hard. It's hard to argue that one. Um, the cat. The awards include an Oscar for best actress, best supporting actress, and best writing. Golden Globe for best actress and supporting actress. An, an American County Award for funniest supporting actress. An ASCAP Award for top box office films. A Silver Berlin Bear for best director. I want a silver Berlin bear. That just sounds cool. Uh, <laughs> and Arteos for best casting uh, on a feature film. That's a award we haven't covered yet. Uh, a silver ribbon for best foreign actress at the Italian National Syndicate of Film Journalists. I felt since it's an Italian oh. movie, probably worth bringing that one up. And a uh, best film or best screenplay from the WGAs. Not a, nice. not a bad Very haul. Nice. Not a bad haul. Uh, Ryan, I think you have some fun facts for me. I do, I do. We've got three of them, as fact. Uh, Nicholas Cage's screen test didn't impress the studio. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, God. And they wanted to get someone else to play Ronnie, but Cher insisted that Cage was the one to play that role and threatened to quit unless he was hired. After a few days, the studio relented. Why, though? <laughs> I'm, mm, I'll hold it. it I'll hold could, it. Could, I'll hold it. You could argue Cher That's, may have made Nick Cage's career what it is today. Maybe, man. Honestly. May, I, mm, mm. All right. All right. <laughs> I'll hold it. Next, next fun fact. <clears throat> Norman Jewison has stated that the climactic kitchen sequence was the most difficult scene that he had ever shot in his career. The crew were dismissed, and Jewison rehearsed with the cast for some time, using a stage production approach. Only after the actors perfected their timing did he decide where to put the camera. Which is interesting. I like the way he did that, actually. Uh-huh. Yeah. I wonder how, um, I wonder... Because that, that looked to be, like, an actual, like, functional kitchen. It did, And yeah. I might, I might have, ju- I might just be wrong, but it looked, like, if, if it was an actual real kitchen, then filming in, with that enclosed space with those many different angles would be challenging. So it makes sense that he waited to, to, for them to, to get the timing down before he actually started finalizing some stuff. I feel like a lot of your best camera work is going to be done by people who are going to go out of the way to make sure, especially with scenes that have a lot of people to make sure the timing's right because you don't want to fuck that up and then you have to redo it again and again and again. Like, get it right the first time and call it good. Yeah. Knives Out kind of comes to mind when I think of that because like the, like the, they're, they're filming like a scene with like 10, 15 people in like a living room and they've got to work with big ass cameras to get certain shots. And yeah, it's a whole thing. I'm getting off topic. Good on you, uh, Mr. Jewison, for, for making that choice. And I think oh, it damn. came out why haven't very, we covered, very well. Why, why haven't we covered Knives Out yet? That seems like a good movie we should have done. 
We absolutely should do that. I am one. I will one hundred percent talk about Knives Out for hours. <laughs> <laughs> it's so fucking good. It's really. Good. Uh, final fun fact here. According to Nicolas Cage, the acting style he was channeling while doing the hand <laughs> speech. <laughs> God damn it! Um. I'm holding it. I'm holding it. <clears throat> Excuse me. The acting style he was channeling while doing the hand speech was inspired by watching the body language of actor Rudolf Klein Rogue in director Fritz Lang's 1927 German expressionist film Metropolis. I can safely say I have never seen it. <laughs> Although I it it absolutely does not surprise me that Nicolas Cage was basing is basing his uh his artistic and actorial approach uh like like deeply in like cinema classics and whatnot like from from everything we've we've dealt with him about like all of his choices have like some some basis in something that's happened in cinema that really resonated with him. So it's, it's not surprising to hear that. Absolutely. Um, we'll do some initial thoughts real quick. I think this movie's fine. It's not a personal favorite we've done either for Nick Cage or the show, but overall I said, it's not a bad watch. I'm, I'm definitely looking forward to getting diving deep into this one. Yeah. Hmm. Okay. Um, I think it is a, I think it's an interesting rom-com that gives a very interesting look into kind of the like Italian American culture of that time period. I am not sure what the fuck Nick Cage is doing in this movie. I love him, but I'm not <laughs> sure how he fits in here. So what is it? Arguably is the least Nick Cage movie of the Nick Cage movies, while also channeling his true Nick Cage. It, it, <laughs> I was, I, I, there were multiple times in my viewing that I that I was sitting, I was yelling at, at my TV like, "Why are you here, Nick? What what is this? What are you doing?" Oh my god! Yeah, uh, no, I think it's I think it's a gr- I think it's a good movie. I think Nick Nick Cage more often than not feels like a puzzle piece that's out of place, but I still think overall the movie is very, is, is fun to watch. Indeed. Indeed. Let's see. Let's, let's, let's dive into the snaps here. Sharon's about to get married to some Italian schmuck. Before the ceremony, he has to go to Sicily to see his dying mother. Uh, he makes one request. Go find my brother and get him to come to the wedding. Uh, as he wants to resolve the bad blood between them. She does this and, uh, she, she she does, and this brother, Ronnie, sweeps her off her feet, literally, and they bane it out. Also, literally. Uh, she immediately feels guilty, but strikes a deal with Ronnie. He will leave her alone if he can get one more night with her at the opera because he loves her as mu- and he loves the opera. Seems like a good deal, but kind of a deal with the devil, so to speak. They go, but he still convinces her to come upstairs to bed with him. And fuck. Uh, <laughs> of course. <laughs> of course, uh, Ronnie's brother returns home from Sicily, and he wants to talk to Loretta. So everyone has to meet at Loretta's uh, the next day. The brothers make up. Uh, Loretta is about to confess to the affair when Johnny calls off the whole marriage. Uh, anyway, because he's worried them getting married will kill his mother somehow. Uh, pretty sure that's not how marriage works, uh, Johnny. I'm pretty sure that's not how that works. Anyway, so Ronnie takes up the ring and asks Loretta to marry him instead, and it's a happy ending, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> that kitchen scene's fun. I cannot wait to get into that. But before we do, let's talk performances, Ryan. <laughs> he took my hand! He took my bride! I was like, what are you shouting for, my guy? What's happening? <laughs> it's a weird level of overact. So we're obviously going to hit Nick Cage first. So it's it's... It's a weird level of overacting I was not expecting, because this movie seems very, like, toned down and simple. And I'm wondering, is he doing it because his character is that much into stage? Or is it because his character's got some mental quirk that he's trying to just sort of play out? Like, I'm trying to figure out what the motive behind the performance is. Like, I get where it's inspired from, but, like, how does it fit into this role is what I'm trying to figure out. So, my initial thought... Uh, for that 
was um okay well my initial my initial thought and you can tell i've been watching too much cinema sins was that movie takes 25 minutes to properly nick cage um, <laughs> uh but after that like like you like the the hand monologue and like the the crazy like performance is literally the first introduction to the character that we get and I, like when I watched it, I, I I I had the feeling like this is young Nick Cage, and I don't just mean like he's young in appearance, it was like he is personally a young person doing this, but it feels like in his actor's toolkit, it's like it's like raw, unfiltered Nick Cage, like someone just like go nuts, like like deliver a passionate monologue about how you lost your hand and how your brother is responsible for every bad thing that happened to you in your life. And he just Nick Cages on full blast. And, and it's before he learns how to tone that shit down or add some nuance to it. So that being the introduction to the character was a little, dis- like a little jarring a little disjointed for me and i was a, i was i was wor- i was asking what the fuck is he doing in this movie like i love him but i don't think he's right for this role but as we get to learn a bit more about him and the uh the scenes with him in at the opera and him talking to loretta about how life isn't really meant to be lived safely. It's meant to be messy and you're meant to actually live your life rather than playing it safe. I was like, okay, this I buy. This I like. So I loved his performance towards the middle to end of the movie. I thought he he, he really filled his character out. Yeah, when he acts like a human being. When he's not fucking shouting to the heavens and his wooden hand, you know? <laughs> I'm, I, like I said, I'm also trying to figure out what it is. I think it honestly is either A, just Nick Cage being insane, which is probably the simplest explanation, or B, because it's allowed to be in the movie, I assume it's because his character's obsession with opera and with performance just has him do this. Like, if it was just any old schmuck, like any old person he didn't care about, but he wants to put on performance for her because I think he likes her from the get go. Like, like you said already, you know, Cher's an attractive person and it, it, and obviously she's playing an attractive character. So Nick Cage sees this and it's like, I want to put on a show for her. I want to perform to show just how much, emo- how much emotion I can pull in this. I want to show how sensitive a person I can be. I want her to feel like she can connect with me. And the only way I can do that is by just hamming this shit up old school, man. And so that's what he does, and I don't think it necessarily works all levels, but I think for the kind of character we're dealing with here, this very emotional, kind of unbalanced character, it kind of works a little bit. Hmm. That's I interesting. Think, okay. And I think as the relationship goes on, I think as he becomes more comfortable around her and realizes that they are a thing... He starts to mellow out a bit more because it's like, I can kind of be more myself and not have to put on this performance for her anymore. That is, okay, that is interesting. It's not the, it's not the read that I had on it, but it is very interesting. I think the... It's a stretch. I, I I'll think, admit it's a stretch. I, th- I think what I was, what I was thinking was that essentially, since she showed up and was connected to his brother. It's just like all of the fury and the passion that he had towards his brother went towards her. And when she was able to take that, when she was able to deal with it and still want to try to work things out with him, he got a bit intrigued. And when she was in his apartment, she would challenge him on essentially beliefs that he's held for the past five years and then he in turn challenges her and she's not used to really being called out on her shit and it's that back and forth that kind of has them get together in a very bizarre scene (laughs) but (laughs) still it it, it works so like i don't know like i think 
Yes, I think after the initial introduction to the character, which ideally you kind of want to be better, you kind of want to start strong rather than... I, I would recommend you start strong and then end okay rather than start shaky and then end amazing. All right, but that's just that's just my personal opinion. Still, I think it was I think it was an interesting performance, and I feel like it it's definitely early in Nick Cage's career because it felt more unpolished than the stuff that I've seen him do before. It felt very raw, yeah, yeah. To um, to make a long. Yeah thought short <laughs> how do you feel about uh Cher's performance uh and i know obviously i don't think now that you have mentioned that you've never seen her before uh let's get the next question but would, would you want to see more of her um i would i would um i think it's uh i think what i what i loved most about her performance is how realistic and how natural she felt like she she felt like a a normal Italian American woman from New York in that time period. She felt at home and at play and at peace in that setting. So like, I mean, I would, I would be interested in seeing more of her work if she does more than that. Cause she had a very, she had a very realistic charm about her before she got all dolled up. Like she had a very practical, charm to her and i felt myself being drawn to her even as she was kind of nagging at danny aiello's character uh in the midst of it and like trying to like like combat curses and bad luck by like like locking in a marriage that she like to a person that she doesn't love but is perfectly fine and she could see herself being with for a while and it'll be okay so I, 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 yeah, I did, I did really enjoy her performance because I believed it. Mm-hmm. I was not expecting that much from her. I know her as a music artist more than anything else. And right. I'm not saying musicians can't act, but I just was not aware of her acting abilities. I've seen her really do well on screen. I'm like, okay, okay. You've convinced me. Uh, I, I will happily check out anything else you got. If there's anything else, there's not a huge list of shared performances that are, film based uh she didn't stick with that very long um went back to music pretty quick and it just worked better for her so or fashion i think might be what she did after this i don't know but uh i do know this was a very short-lived uh career switch yeah yeah that makes sense yeah um was she a right to fight for cage to stay in the film <sighs> that's a big question ain't it yes it is, it is. <laughs> I, had, I had I had no idea that 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 was a thing. Um, I I'm going to say yes, and my reason is twofold. One, because I think the I think Nick Cage's performance towards like towards the back half of the movie really sold the character. Like, cause I, I, I saw where he was coming from and the fact that he was making a compelling argument, despite the obvious rough edges in his character and in his personality made it a bit more real for me. So it wasn't like perfect and polished and like amazingly presentable and here is a well-articulated argument on why you should take a chance on me and da 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 it wasn't that you know like he he, his character still had the ragged edges from when you were introduced to him but he felt passionately about her and he really felt like she was right for him and he fought for that so i think yes it's good based on the second part the second half of his performance and also because i'm not sure who i would have play him aside from him but that's mostly because i'm not super well versed in actors around that time period that no, could you, have fit the role i think you i agree with you but i think my reasoning is a little simpler um oh yeah kind of. i think it's more just Cher probably felt Cage was the right fit for her character. Um, I think she felt the chemistry. I think she felt the the connection with him 
during the screen test. I think that's what clicked for her, is my guess. Um, mm-hmm. I don't know why you'd fight hard if that wasn't the case. Um, yeah. So I would say that if she felt like it helped her performance, I don't see why you wouldn't fight for that. And so yeah, I would say that was probably a good call on her part. Um, speaking of which, uh, which couple do you think had the best uh, chemistry on screen? Because we get to see hands, a, we get to see a few different couples, honestly. Hands down, John Mahoney and the mom. Yeah, that was fun. <laughs> that was unexpectedly. That fun. was so good, and I was I, I I I I was simultaneously proud and sad that they didn't get together because it it worked so well like you could tell like on a very personal level they were connecting and even though this is the first time that he's really met this woman and they're just sharing dinner and she shared she she offered to share dinner with him because she was just trying to 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 be polite but he was opening up and like talking in a way that you could you could see he wasn't really used to sharing with other women and the fact that both Cher and the mom commented that he was with women that were too young for him that immediately when he's talking to the mom he's more at ease and he's more at peace and he's a bit shyer but also just a bit more relaxed and real but he's also charming and honest and she's feeling the warmth of that interaction because she's been neglected at home for so long. I really wanted that to work, but I was also really proud of her because she's like, at the end of the day, I'm a married woman and I know who I am. And I don't want that decision to screw up what I think of myself as. I need to. I need to keep my my house together. And she fights for her marriage. That's that's like I think this movie does a really good job of showcasing like kind of all the angles of love, and the mom making the conscious decision to stick it out and really work it out with her husband, despite the fact that she knows in her heart that he was cheating. I don't know, man, that was just really powerful for me. So yeah, I definitely say it was that one. There's something to be said about that. And we're actually going to dive into a bunch of questions here about relationships specifically. Uh, the first one of which is, uh, are any of these relationships really any real? And, uh, does this film seem to say it? Uh, what does this? Uh, what does love seem to me to these people? Are any of these relationships real? Um. <laughs> well, no. I mean, consider the fact that a lot of them are uh, marriages with a at, at, on the front on the surface with you know affairs in, in, in behind the scenes. And I guess the question is. Are relationships real when there is adultery and when there is uh, secret side relationships in play that aren't being uh, aren't consented to, or um, it, or is it still real? But they're all real, or what? I, I don't know. It's a weird way to work, I suppose. No, I mean, I I, I get what you I get where you're coming from. I think uh, I think. This movie does a very good job of showcasing different facets of love and human interaction that romance movies don't typically do. Because you have the relationship that's held on to because it's safe. You have people stepping out on their relationship because... There's somebody new that looks at them like they're like the most interesting thing on like on on the planet and they're new and shiny and you feel great because of the attention that they give you. Uh, There are people who step out because they're they they're, they're desperate and want like wanting they're desperately wanting to feel alive despite 
constantly making the safe choice and like wanting a thrill out of life. There are people who feel neglected and uh, unappreciated in their relationship and they get that from somebody else. I think that all of these are very real concepts when dealing with relationships and I don't think it makes the love that they have for each other any less real. So, I mean, I think it's, I think the movie does a very interesting job of kind of showing the sides of love that aren't really focused on in romance and in and, and, uh, and a good amount of mainstream romance media, if that makes sense. Right. And, and, and having never really been in a relationship where an affair has occurred either on my side or the other person's side. It's one of those things where it's hard for me to kind of grasp or understand. Like, I know people who have gone through this, and it's fucked them up. Um, and yeah. I know people who have done it, and it's fucked themselves up, too. So, it's a very strange um, element when it comes to relationships, I suppose. And I guess this brings me to my next question. Do you believe people who have affairs can still be good people? Why or why not? I do. I do. I think... I think we are all imperfect people. I think mistakes happen. I think flaws in a relationship, when they go unaddressed, can lead to some very drastic things that happen. Um... I think com- lack of communication is pretty much the death knell in damn near all re- like in in a good portion of the, of relationships. Like lack of communication will definitely fuck up anything and lead to something big like someone cheating on the other person. I don't think you're automatically a a a uh, uh, in an an unsalvageable wreck of a human being and just an absolute piece of shit because that happens. I don't think that is the case. I think it's definitely a harmful thing and it's by no means a great thing, a good thing at all to betray the person that you're with. But I do think mistakes happen and I don't think that one decision like completely tarnishes you as a person. Otherwise, we'd all be tarnished, like, irrevocably. Oh, we're all going to hell, I'm pretty sure of it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Speak for yourself, I'm trying over here. <laughs> uh, no, but I, I will say that if anyone listening is considering some kind of uh, extramarital or out-of-relationship affair without consulting their partner about the reasons why you want to do that, or you don't feel like you can... Uh, address those reasons, I would say stop and maybe have that conversation. Even if you think it's going to make things uncomfortable, have it. You know, Yeah, you could go do the thing and make the mistake and have to clean it up later, but I think it's healthier if you pause, think about the situation you're in, and ask yourself why are you doing this? Is this going to be what makes you happy? And if so, talk to your, your significant other and explain or come to a reasonable uh, consensus on it. Maybe it means your relationship needs to end. Maybe it means you need to work on it. Or maybe you want to open it up. I can't tell you, but yeah, it's better than hurting your partner, hurting the person you might be going with, and hurting yourself on the end, too. Absolutely. I 100% agree. If you are having these thoughts, talk to your goddamn partner about them (laughs) like like talk it out it will be i guarantee you it will be less awkward of a conversation than the conversation you're going to have to have saying that you cheated it will absolutely be less convert less awkward than that conversation do yourself do your partner and do yourself the respect of talking that shit out before you make a mistake you cannot take back um, this film draws a lot of connections between the moon and love uh, a- 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 throughout the narrative. Why do you think it is, and do you agree with the beliefs this film's 
basically thrown out there. Lol, no. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I think I think it's a. I, I, I think it's I think it's a fun notion and I think there is something very romantic about a full moon and being with the person that you love and like driven to like grand romantic gestures. Like I think that's a thing. But I don't I'm not gonna say, Oh, if when the moon hits your eye like a big piece of pie, you're gonna step out on your wife. I'm not gonna say that. I'm not gonna say that at all. <laughs> Um, again, again, I I'm think probably it's... saying I did not, I did not request that. <laughs> um, it was more like speak singing, but that's fine. I, I, um, I, I, I it's just after the 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 uh, the Willie's Wonderland. I want to make sure everyone's clear that I'm not requiring this. <laughs> <laughs> I will make it clear when I'm being coerced. <laughs> uh, no, but I think um, I think it works as a fun plot device for the movie. But I don't, and I think there is something inherently romantic about a full moon. I don't think, I, I, I don't give any credence to special powers over a full moon to people acting wildly in love. No. <laughs> yeah, the, the only powers I'm familiar with with the moon are uh, water bending. And I don't think it says any one bit. But, um... No, I, I, I thought you were going to say lycanthropy, but that's fine. Oh, yeah, fuck, lycanthropy's also... <laughs> <laughs> You're a wolf! You, you didn't you didn't put that together? Do you think wolves and waterbenders, like, get together sometimes? They're just like, hey, what do you think of that moon? You want to do, like, a moon convention? Moon it up? No? Oh, okay. God, now I'm thinking of, like, a waterbender and a werewolf, and this is getting far off topic. What's your next question? Oh, God! Uh, but no, 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 I'll I'll say that yeah I think the the constant connections were a little silly and repetitive and didn't take away from the film by any means but it was one of those things I'm like rolling my eyes I'm like okay okay I get it you guys are throwing us out there can, can we get can we move on to the plot again because this, this is a little weird um, but yeah that's all I gotta say on that one um, last relationship question I'll really hit up on how would you describe Loretta's relationships to both Ronnie and or Johnny. Um, I mean, I think, uh, fuck, which one was Johnny? So Johnny <laughs> was the guy who left to go see his mom and then came back and okay. was like, oh no, I, I I can't do it because she might die for some reason. Okay, Danny Aiello. Gotcha, gotcha. Okay. Um, I mean, I think the relationship to Johnny was done out of convenience and out of safety like he he was a good choice and he was a nice man he wouldn't hurt her he would provide for her and like so like on paper it's it, it's a good choice of a marriage um so she makes that choice out of I, I'm hesitant to say out of fear, but yeah, it's kind of out of fear because the first person that she married, she married for love and then he passed away and she's like, well, I'm not trying to have that happen again. So I just want somebody that I'll be safe with and that we can be perfectly fine. I don't need to, I don't need to swing for the fences at this point anymore. I just want somebody that can take care of me. But uh, once she interacts with Ronnie and the passion that he has and the passion that he has for her, the passion that she makes him feel, it kind of overtakes her. And she like the whole like her whole arc at that point is to whether whether or not she plays it safe and thinks of all of these other uh, factors in her life, or whether she goes after what she really cares about, and what really makes her feel alive. I'm looking forward to the Moonstruck 2 sequel, which we should be getting any day now. Where... <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're, like, we're, we're about 33 years yeah, uh, ahead? Where yeah. we're Ronnie's dead, and she's got to find another relationship. God damn. <laughs> Nick Cage gets hit by a bus. She's like, fuck. God damn it. Why can't love work for me? It's bad luck. It's bad luck. Again. All right. We got to get married in a church. Got to do the whole thing. Set a date. But uh, no, I, I think you hit the nail on the head. I think Johnny is definitely the, the quote unquote safe pick. And Ronnie is the not 
dangerous pick, but he's the he's the risky one. He's the one who's like, you're not gonna get guaranteed a happy life, but you're gonna be happy with the pick, so to speak. And yeah, I think that sums it up best. But I hope people aren't that aren't like, oh, those are the only two options. Like, no, there's a lot of middle ground guys. Just just yeah, you know, be open to any relationship out there. Just just, just you know, don't 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 feel like you have to settle, but don't feel like you have to go for the unpredictable wild cards either. Like, don't be a Harley Quinn. Don't 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 pick joker because it's a bad call <laughs> i've watched a lot of harley go for, quinn go for poison the ivy and, it's the better pick yeah dude i'm looking forward to when that happens according to amanda because she looked it up uh between episodes and apparently it does happen sometime in season two she didn't tell me when i'm like okay that's all i care about let's, let's roll let's do this so <laughs> uh let's go on to the kitchen scene we've got a few questions about that and then we'll wrap up here uh, what All do right. you make of the camera work and framing this scene? Obviously, there was a fun fact about it. So, what 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 do you feel? How do you feel? Um, I don't know. I felt like it was a really good scene. Um, I felt like, like, like it absolutely had to be done to multiple takes because <laughs> you you were getting such personal, like like close and personal shots and angles. Um, but I felt like it really. It, it mimicked the feeling that you would get sitting around a small-ish table with your family. You know, like you're, you're, you're right next to, to them, you're arm to arm, and you're having this, com- you're having these conversations, you're sharing this meal, and you're kind of very, very close audiences to conversations happening between two people at some times and sometimes you just have to shut the fuck up and let that conversation happen and i think it adequately caught the awkwardness of some familial uh interactions so i thought it was shot very very well i appreciate that it also kind of like showed the chaos that happens and i'm not talking like you know end of the world like things are blowing up chaos like just how chaotic and how frantic a a family sit down in a kitchen can be, especially when you have all these moving parts and pieces and different people coming in and out. Like, it was definitely a very well choreographed scene just to kind of give you that feel, that kind of energy, and I think it worked really well. Um, were you expecting uh, Johnny to be as okay with Ronnie and Loretta as he was? And uh, why do you think he he allows his mother to control his life the way he does? I think. Ultimately, he was a bit in shock <laughs> until the end. Dude, he was just sitting like, in the back of the room, just kind of like staring at the floor for a while. Like, what the fuck? He was just—he was stuck, man. He like he came in like he he came in expecting to break bad news to Loretta, and then not only does he find out that his brother is there. But then they hash it out a bit and it's still kind of fraught and like un like like it's still not repaired. And then he finds out that Loretta and his brother have hooked up, and then his brother proposes to Loretta after he says he can't marry her. And then he took his ring to propose to his ex fiance. I feel like a lot of shit happened to Johnny in rapid succession. So he was just like buffering in the background. <laughs> he was just like trying to piece it together. Like, what the fuck just happened in the past 15 minutes? He doesn't have enough RAM to cut process all that. Like, really? He does it. And, and the grandpa was just like, hey. Come over here and have a glass of champagne. <laughs> You're a part of the family. Just, just, just roll with it. Shit, shit is wild in this family. Just, just roll with it. So I appreciated Grandpa at that point. Yeah, it was definitely a nice little gesture at the end there. Um, yeah, uh, Loretta seemed. That's the mom, by the way. Uh, wait, no, sorry. Loretta's mom. Uh, there's a uh, seemed really laid back in her knowledge of her husband's infidelity. Do you think this is the best approach, and uh, should she have just left him? I feel like so. I mean, so yeah, uh, we, we touched, we touched bit, on this think, yeah. a little bit earlier, um, but I feel like relationships, like forty years in the making, like real old school relationships. They have grown children and like they're like they're waiting on grandkids and they're trying to figure out what they're going to do with their house. Like, I feel like 
that deeply uh, those deeply established relationships are worth fighting for especially if you know your partner in such a way that you can tell it's not irrevocably broken but that something has gone wrong i think that much work like that that much effort that's gone into it is worth fighting for and i think ultimately the dad knew that as well because after he was called out on it he just ex- he accepted it because while while this this new girl was was making him feel alive and was impressed at all of his plumbing acumen and fucking and like stories and just like this new and shiny person at the end of the day like he comes home and is completely comfortable with his wife and i think he knew that that was worth fighting for as well it wasn't worth throwing it away for this this woman who while is very pretty and is very enamored with him doesn't have the substance that he has with his wife i I can only imagine him his conversation and approaching this this girl for his his affair be like hey you pressed by uh you impressed by my plumbing acumen little girl let me tell you, let me tell you something. Let me tell you something. I know how to lay some pipe. <laughs> what was really killing me was that he was smooth as hell with this girl. Like he was he was laying it down. Like she was she was she was she was very into it and he he was just feeling himself. Like he 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 looked like like player of the year when he was when he was uh taking her out. So like it was it was very interesting to see. I it, uh, to be quite honest the the difference was so big I did not realize that it was the dad until they like 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 she saw him at the opera. It's just like, "Oh shit, that's her dad." Fuck. It's almost- He's a completely different person around this woman. Because he feels, like, more alive. It's just, like, it's, like, night and day. So, I, I get it. I, I, I do understand. I get it. Almost kind of like he was wearing a mask or something and kind of showing his true colors, almost. <laughs> Ronnie's like, no, 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 you've got to take your face off. Off. <laughs> <laughs> now, we're, st- we're still a few years too early for that. I'm so sorry. <laughs> Listen, we can't do a Nick Cage season, or much less a Nick Cage episode, without mentioning Face Off. I, th- I think that's like the granddaddy of Nick Cage. It really is. It really is. Um, so this is kind of an observation I had. I noticed in a lot of the scenes that they incorporate a lot of like food into the scene, whether it was like in a re- at the restaurant or just sitting down and eating something, or in this kitchen scene by itself. Do you think there's any like reason behind the focus on the film or on uh, on the food in the film, or do you think it was just kind of there for the set? I think, and of course, I am by no means an authority on what I'm about to say, but this is just my uh, uneducated opinion. I think food is inherently very important in Italian culture. And so the focus on that was really a focus on, or like an an integral part of the Italian American experience that they were really trying to paint in this movie, because that like, that's what it shouted to me. It shouted New York Italian Americans in the late eighties. This is that movie and everything like the, like the interesting romance angle is laid is embedded in italian american culture like everything around that was was like shouted that so the food kind of spoke to that as well uh in my opinion i I can see that i I also kind of just thought too one of the most intimate and romantic things you can do aside from you know banging is uh (laughs) you know sharing a meal with each other whether you're cooking it for the person you're with or just getting together and just have and sharing a meal together in general 
Um, I mean, so many people would say their first date is just going to a nice restaurant or something like that. Um, so I would say having food be kind of a centerpiece in your romantic story is not something that would be too out of out of the ordinary. I think it kind of, when you incorporate the Italian culture to it too, it really ties in because I would say, and it's, again, I don't want to come off as an expert right there or, or, or I guess arguably racist if that's the word that applies here, but I do have an understanding that I think Italian culture is very proud of the cuisine they make. I mean, they have an entire restaurant industry of Italian restaurants for that reason, I would assume. So, um, yeah, no, I, I would say that all tracks pretty well. Hmm, yeah. Uh, last question. Should Loretta really have married Ronnie so quick? Why or why not? <laughs> <laughs> and by the way, this will probably be a question we get a few times in our upcoming Disney season. Just stay tuned. I mean, I think... I think the plot demanded it. I feel like the plot demanded it. Um, like, in, a, in a realistic standpoint, absolutely not. In a realistic standpoint, you, you like you like she would be dating Ronnie for a while to figure out if she could actually live with him if she wasn't going to murder him. But uh, at this point, um, she she absolutely wanted to get married uh, quicker, and he he's kind of like like <coughs> reviving. He's kind of coming back to life after realizing that. There's life after the 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 person the woman that he thought he was going to marry a couple of years ago. So he's absolutely uh, he's absolutely enamored with her, and they've already banged it out. And he's been like, "Well, that's fantastic," but I also took her to the opera, and she cried, and she was beautiful when she cried, and it moved her like it moved me. It's just like, yes, absolutely. I'm in love with you. I'd like to spend the rest of my life doing this. Let's go. Let's go. So I feel like in a realistic standpoint, absolutely not. But for the movie, it absolutely makes sense. Yeah, I I, I would say that it, it, that, that pretty much tracks, I think, any, uh, what's the word? any fictionalized like romance. You're going to speed things up, obviously, because, well, hey, listen, we, we, we got 90 minutes here. Let's get moving. Um, yeah, but, we, we, we've got to put a bow on it. We've got to put the, the, the happily ever after tag on it. We've got to get the credits on it because we got to get the next show in here in like 10 minutes. <laughs> um, but <laughs> I, I, I think for what it is, it works. Um, and I do know there are some people who have gotten married with a very short period of dating and s somehow it works. Um, there are arranged marriages that have somehow worked. So it's not unheard of. It's very rare, but... Um, I would, love to see, I would love to see, like, how this relationship turned out. I'm not demanding a 30-year-later sequel by any means. But <laughs> I would love to at least know that, hey, these two made it work. Or they had kids. Or, you know what, it didn't work out after all. Shit, shit blew up in their faces. Yeah. Just some kind of iota to know that, hey, this is, this is the overall uh, thesis on how this kind of love works. You know, I I'd be curious to see where that goes. But I wouldn't necessarily do anything about it. <laughs> um, That's a lot for questions, Ryan. Is there anything else you wanted to add? No, I think we, I think we covered it very, very well there. More thorough than I remember writing the questions. Actually, I wrote this. So we, we so behind the scenes thing. We planned to record this a couple weeks ago, and uh, our schedule got buckled up. I won't, I won't name any names, but. Uh, so we pushed this back in the schedule a little bit. No big deal. But I had this written up already. So I don't remember half the questions I wrote for this. So that's why I was coming to this. I'm like, okay, that's what we have here. There's a lot more questions I remember writing the first time around. Holy shit. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah, that's one of those That's one of those episodes where I'm just coming back to it like time capsule almost. Uh, anyway, so this is part of the episode where you can tell us uh, what you thought of the film or ask your own questions. And in three months' time, I will get to them. And they will be like another time capsule for us. And Ryan, if they want to get to us uh, directly, what is the best way they can get to us? Uh, that is, uh, when the moon hits your eye like a bigger pizza pie, that's amore. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> that's evacstation at gmail.com. 
You know, I, I could go for a pizza pie right now. Let's, let's do it. Me too. Damn, I haven't had pizza in a minute. Dude, I, I make a mean deep deep dish. Now that's love. I make a mean deep dish. When you are in town next, I will find some time to throw together a deep dish because that shit was pretty oh, good. Oh, yes. Absolutely. I, I would love to taste uh, taste your rendition on a deep dish pizza. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, this is a part of the show where we rank the episode from platinum to trash all the codes in between. Ryan, where do you think Moonstruck strikes? <laughs> um, I I like this one. I, I I did like this one. Um, I I think it's dated. Yeah, but I think it. I still really like it. I still think it's good, and I think it says some interesting and realistic things about love. Um, which uh kind of goes beyond just the 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 sappy feel good story uh that rom coms generally go for. I think it is a bit outlandish in some places. Yeah, and all of those places involve Nick Cage. <laughs> <laughs> just like, uh, what are you doing in this movie? Um. But this movie would be oh, so man. different without him, though, and you know you it would absolutely it. would. I, I, like, I, I, I would not rate this movie as highly if it were not for Nick Cage. But like, like, because, because I think he, he also adds to the craziness. I feel like every character is a bit crazy, and Nick Cage is just kind of more outlandish in his crazy. <laughs> So, like, like when you put it that way, he is kind of he is kind of an interesting fit. He, like, it does actually make a bit more sense that they chose him. Um, I'm gonna give this one a low silver. Um, I had a I had a fun time with it. I don't think it's required viewing by any means, but um, if you want to stare at a gorgeous fucking share, uh, in uh in the late '80s. Uh, and see a very interesting movie with uh, good old Marty Crane uh, trying to trying to flirt with the mom uh, and having like pretty interesting conversations about romance and life. Then I think this is a this is a fun rom com night uh, to watch with with your significant other. Yeah, I wouldn't be opposed to more John Mahoney if he hadn't uh, you know passed away somewhat recently. So yeah, yeah. cool dude, cool dude. Never forget. Um, I will say that for my ranking, I'd probably agree it's either silver or maybe a high bronze, but somewhere in that ballpark, I'm gonna go more silver. Yeah. I'll be nicer to it. Um, just because it's 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 a fun time and the performances are top notch. I mean, it won awards for a reason. Um, but uh, yeah, I, keep it nice and simple there. Uh, next week, assuming I scheduled this correctly, and I might not have. But if I did, next week you will be getting the beginning of our new Disney-centric season. Oh boy, here we go. Major tone shift. Major tone shift. Uh, we'll be starting with Tangled, a movie of the, the the first movie of this group that I have not seen. So that'll be fun. That'll be fun. God, I haven't seen Tangled in forever. So that will be so interesting to go back to. But uh, until next time, we will see you after the credits. Hi. Birds are ring, ding a ling a ling, hey. ding a ling a ling, then you sing hey. Rita Bella. Hearts will play, dibby dibby day, hey. dibby dibby day.